Ask not what Almighty God can do for you. Ask not what you can do for your country. Now the trumpet summons us again, where the strong are summoned to give service, summoned to bear arms. All this will be finished, the final success of failure, asking his blessing, and let us never fear the command to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. Let us begin. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're late to the prayer, but with you, everything is right on time. So, Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to join us on this call. Jesus, be glorified. Father, we ask these things and ask for your presence on this to to speak through us, to use us as an example. All for those that have thoughts, have questions, have, you know, a hunger, Lord, that you satisfy the hunger, that you answer the questions, that you keep refining their thoughts into further and deeper relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for sending us. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for being on this group. No matter what, Lord, your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a bunch of things that I think hit me as I was bounced around on this. And like me, me and my four, it's almost kind of cliche, at least in, in some respects. But as I started to like go through it, I'm like, there's actually a lot here. It started with Psalm 89. I just kind of felt like God had me work backwards. I'm just going to read it and try and you know, get through as fast as I can. Most people focus on Nehemiah saying, look at us. We you know, carry the sword in one hand and build with bricks in the other. But let's also pay attention to the enemy activity and how it correlates today. But it so happened when Sambalot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and he was very indignant and he mocked the Jews. What is Antifa and BLM doing? What's their behavior? Furious, right? very indignant, and they mock publicly. What about hardcore leftist or woke people? What do they do? They're angry, they're indignant, and they mock. So this behavior that we're seeing has already been displayed countless times, biblically speaking, if not all through history. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they compete it? all in a day. So curiosity stirs up, and this is what we consider what the enemy is is doing, right? Spiritual surveillance. He's asking questions. It starts with a question. Something's driving at him internally. He's got this angst, and then he seeks to accomplish, you know, what he wants to know. So there's a whole spiritual surveillance apparatus, right? So you have surveilling spirits. Oftentimes, witchcraft and occultists you know, try and do, and Charlie, you, you can chime into what Ramirez was talking about before, when they do the whole astral projection, and I know that there's Christians that try and operate with that, but they're trying to gain intelligence. They're trying to watch you, they're trying to see certain things. And so this whole clandestine intelligence system is hidden until they don't need to hide it anymore. So as these systems get bigger and bigger, because the church, the institution isn't pushing back, expect more of it. And when the enemy gets mad, right? Fury, anger, and mocking. And I would argue to say, what's our response? And it's something I need to do a quick segue with that I didn't throw into the other group. So God actually tells us what he wants our response to be. First and foremost, it's Matthew 5, 44, right? The whole love your enemies. And this is, again, it's counterintuitive. If someone's angry at you, indignant and mocking you, what's God saying his move is? You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So that's the first move. And then Proverbs kind of brings it home. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Or the Lord will see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from him. And so if if you even think about that, right? Even if the enemy is openly mocking you, is angry, is indignant, agitated, there is a spiritual posture first. The first spiritual posture is to not gloat, to pray for your enemies. The second spiritual posture, of course, is Jesus telling his disciples, before when I sent you, you didn't need a bag, didn't need clothes, didn't need money, didn't need a sword. But now that I leave and I send you, take clothing, take a bag, you know, take money. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy a sword. 
So now we have this church age posture. And as the church age is turning into the kingdom age, we have to carry that forward even more. But it's just interesting to see that we think, oh my gosh, it's Antifa, it's BLM. Like it's just a human psychological condition. And it's not. This is a spiritual condition that's operating behind the scenes. And the longer that we keep trying to throw human solutions at spiritual problems, we're not going to make much traction. It's even for law enforcement, right? Like what's law enforcement experiencing? People having flare-ups of attitude and emotions. And so if you understand the spiritual backing behind it, and your, your kit doesn't include not just the full armor of God, but like actually going on the spiritual offensive and discerning the spiritual motivation behind things. It's not that it's not available to you. It's just that your job could be a lot easier if you had the Holy Spirit basically operating with you. In the entire Old Testament book of Obadiah is in a nutshell, just what you said, don't dance on the grave of those that God has got in judgment, right? We're not, we're not to do that. We're not to rejoice in our enemies when they're being uh, taken to the woodshed by God. Um, and, and it's, I don't know, if, you know, loving our enemies is counterintuitive. It, it is in one sense, if you, if you smuggle the world's view of love into the whole equation, but if you define it from God's love, because that love is agape love, and, and obviously John 3.16 purposely encapsulates what love is, right? It's from God. Agape love is from God, and, and we reflect it. So, and, and because God gave his only son, then it's about salvation. It's about drawing people into the kingdom. So loving our neighbors and our enemy has to do with we care about where they spend eternity. We care about if they don't spend yeah. eternity rotting in hell. So it's not like we have to like them. It's not like we have to like let them into our house or inside of our gate to wreak havoc on us. Uh, it means we have to care about where they spend eternity. And if we have to take a few blows to drag them from darkness into light, then we have to be willing to do that. Um, but I think you would agree with me if it's somebody's totally debased and an enemy of God who set their face, well, by all means, we put them down like a rabid dog. Uh, well, at least my attitude. Well, and here's here's the balance to it. So I only made that statement because I want like anyone that's watching or listening to understand, like, listen, the the world says, you know, deal deal back in harsher measure than what than how you're dealt. Right. And Christ is saying, do something different. Right. And so I, I even go back to the church and to the Menet church, like, listen, you're gonna be called on to defend your communities. So as lawlessness abounds, right, as there will be powers of lawlessness. And those that you know work iniquity that will be coming to steal, kill, and destroy, who's going to back up the police? If the police are are now looking out for their families, if the military's sent abroad, or they're they're on a camp, or they're under attack, right? The community has to come together for one another. If we know that there are people that are serving in in some protective capacity, right? They need to be cared after and looked after. And there needs to be a community that says, like, you know, so then, especially for the men that, have, that put on the uniform that actually go out there, like, we better be covering them in prayer first. But at the very least, if shit hits a fan, we're also going to cover them in person and we're going to look out for one another. Right. It's very difficult to do that if you don't have community. Right. And so the, the call to arms is a preemptive one before shit hits the fan. Get to church. Even if you don't like the pastors, find one that you can tolerate. Build up your spirit. Build up your faith. Be the pastor six days a week build community, you know, buy guns, buy ammo, and then see where it goes. At the very least, you know, have have what you need, right? It, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. But listen, the, the worst possible thing the government is doing, and, and you see, they're, uh, they're attacking firearm ownership because they don't want you to protect yourself. Right. And what's the one thing a criminal is, is at least reluctant on, if not even, even downright afraid of, is a victim willing to defend themselves all the way. It's the only thing that, that's actually deterrent against criminals. I'm glad we're talking about this because I've always struggled with this this point. You know, th does God want us to take up arms and uh, defend ourselves in that way? You know, like like where where's the line? What what does God expect of us if if we're in a hostile environment? Um, you know, what is it? You know, are, are we justified in taking up arms and? and taking a life i mean what's your guys thoughts on that you defend innocence you always stand and defend innocence that's what a righteous man does and, and so uh, i would answer you with i guess as i've understood it to be you know a very harsh truth god wants us to turn the other cheek when people are challenging us and questioning our faith god wants us to carry a sword and sell our cloak and buy a sword if someone's coming to kill us for it. The conditions have changed. 
the Holy Spirit is the one that decides the rules of engagement, to be honest. So if you're actually operating on a righteous, godly footing and a firm foundation of the Word, the Word says to operate, to be zealous for spiritual gifts, to hear from God, to actually hear His voice. And just like with Elijah, it wasn't in the earthquake or the storm, um, it was in the still small voice of the Spirit. And so if you're calling yourself a Christian, yet you don't desire spiritual gifts, and you, do, you don't desire some sort of prophetic understanding, word of knowledge, something, and you don't listen and cultivate the ability to hear the still small voice, in a moment's notice, you could react to something of more of like an earthly or fleshly heart than the Holy Spirit's unction. And to the best of our ability, as we operate first in prayer, as we pour our hearts out, as we pray violently to the measure that we can, where we're even, you know, cursing things, just as Jesus cursed the fig tree, and even declaring after a thousand years, Satan's going to die. He's going to be destroyed. We declare that in prayer. And again, we know that ultimately God's will be done. But if we're able to hash that out spiritually and actually rise to a place of spiritual violence, and Kyle, others, you know, can attest to this, as you go through your day, your whole footing is different, that you actually approach the whole day, like nothing really throws you off course. And so to answer your question, yes, at a certain measure and certain point, even the end says, we don't start things, but we finish it. God's going to call on his people to engage an army of 200 million souls, right? There's going to be a battle that Jesus comes down as a warlord, and he's going to have an army dressed in battle array, a splendid bride. To that degree, yes, this will be kinetic. And so to the best of our ability, we're supposed to prepare now and operate in prayer until we actually are called to operate in person. Let me read the scripture I put out earlier. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So our first line of attack is clearly speaking the truth of life into every situation and the truth of Christ in every situation. But when that breaks down, <laughs> if you're standing right with Christ and you're standing right with God and your obedience is complete, at that point, the scripture says you need to be ready to punish every disobedience. So at that moment, you don't just lay down and be a doormat and let evil run you over. You stand up and defend what you know to be righteous and true, and you do that zealously because you're called as a man to do that. So um, nowhere do I see Scripture teach us that we're just to lay down and be doormats. Uh, you know that the Apostle Paul didn't take that when the Jews, you know, repeatedly grabbed him and, and beat him. He took them all the way up to the courts of Rome and, and defended himself. Uh, and even when Jesus was slapped by the Roman soldier, Jesus asked him, why did you hit me? And did I not just speak the truth? So I don't know where this attitude has come from, that Christians were just supposed to roll over, lay down, and just be doormats, but it's not its not biblical. We are it's, to stand for righteousness. It's, it's part of escapism. It's the yeah. escapism of a pre-trib rapture of yeah. God, God loves us so much, he's just going to give us a pass. No, God loves us so much, he killed his own son for us. And so if if that's what his fate was, to think that we're going to get out without any skin in the game, is, I would say, prideful, if not entirely outright arrogant. Andrew, does that help? Because, it, again, we don't have a heart for war or murder. We're not trying to, like, be violent people. But we are trying to make sure that God has us firmly on yeah. a foundation. Yeah, it absolutely does. I, I appreciate that take on it, and, and that and that's where I've always I've leaned towards that. I mean, I've been I've been knowing for years. God has really, like I, I said earlier, opened my eyes to what is coming for years now. And uh, I'm one of those. I wouldn't say proper, but you know, I'm not sitting back with my with my arms crossed doing nothing at this point. I, I see it coming. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I guess that makes sense because, you know, I don't know the exact scripture, uh, but talking about the two witnesses being able to devour people with fire. Um, now, whether it's literal or not, I don't know. <laughs> but, but um, you know, so, so I, I agree and I appreciate that take. Thank you. Well, yeah, also remember the Old Testament of God's heart on, on this matter, right? In the Old Testament, God had created a system that if somebody had murdered another person, the punishment was death. 
And if people picked up stones and killed that person for murdering, they were within their right to do that. But remember, God set aside a town that if that guy could hoof it fast enough and get over there, he could get into that town and be protected from them dragging him out until the high priest died, right? And, and he basically had to stay in that town until the high priest died. And then he could come back out again. And that's if he accidentally killed somebody. But he had to get there first. Otherwise, it was kind of like Hunger Games, right? So, you know, the idea that we don't have justice or that we don't have to exact punishment that's equal to the crime, you know, is an Old Testament concept in that sense. But God also allowed for mercy and grace in there. So it isn't as simple and black and white as a lot of people try to make it, right? But obviously in that moment when evil's coming at you and you know that evil needs to be put down it's like a rabid dog you don't question you already know where the rabid dog is going it needs to be dealt with yeah, yeah so so kind of segment off of this conversation and again i don't want to get too far off track here guys but um you know i've always wondered in the end times why people will hate christians so much and, and one of my thoughts was or my theories was is God's anointing will be on many people to where they'll be able to have this type of power similar to the two witnesses when, when they're approached or trying to be killed, that they'll have this power to annihilate people. And, and that will lead to people just hating, hating Christians uh, in the end days. What's your guys' thought on that? People on. Are, yeah, people are going to hate you because you didn't get vaccinated and it's your fault everybody's dying. That's why they're going to hate you. <laughs> No, it's that's, you're that's you're spot perfect. on. Yeah. yeah, you're spot on. Even even with the with the prepping side, like you know, yeah. like you're you're in good company. So I I would even offer this, right? It's not just about being supernaturally kept. It's about supernatural exploits. An exploit is even by definition biblically is where you perform a feat because you are replacing one condition with another. You're you're toppling an evil thing and planting down a better thing a godly thing and so what's going to happen why did the people of uh you know sodom and gomorrah come after lot and they said oh you're the man that judges us judging is speaking up is giving someone an assessment of their current condition so as the holy spirit's operating within us as spiritual exploits pour out the holy spirit's also going to say i need you to speak up and i need you to actually condemn them right what does ezekiel say if, if you see their spiritual condition and you do not warn them, their death and their blood is on your hands. However, if you warn them, I'll actually hold their own, you know, their own death upon them. And so it's, it's going to be by a myriad of different things, but all of them are going to be Holy Spirit orchestrated, every single part of it. So similar to the watchman on the wall. I mean, you know, as watchman, as, as being anointed to see these things coming our direction, we need to stand up and, and be the voice uh to warn people of what we see coming i mean is is that a fair assessment absolutely yeah and nate you'll appreciate this so we had a guy that kind of like got into our group that we have on wednesdays <clears throat> and prayed with him and he had a demonic attack at 3 a.m and i want to i'm going to read this because it's it's relevant if we know that we are being supernaturally kept from demonic influence, ultimately to demonization and demonic you know, oppression where the demons are operating through, this is what people will be in the throes of while we'll be walking around, you know, just clicking our heels. Last night, I woke up out of a dead sleep and shot up out of bed. I couldn't remember my name. I couldn't remember his wife's name. I didn't know where I was or who I was. It was pure confusion. I didn't even know if I was dead or alive on earth or on some other planet. It was pure fear and pure confusion. It was most definitely satanic. The feelings didn't begin to subside until I started praying uh, for me for deliverance from evil. The whole experience lasted about 10 minutes and I went back to sleep. We've spent a lot of time working to expose Satan and evil in our lives over the last week. We are bringing evil to light and it doesn't like the light. Pray for us as we do battle. Can you imagine all the people that don't have the Holy Spirit with them and the mark of God on them? Can you imagine they start acting like that at a moment's notice? I think we're I think we're already seeing some of it. Like think of uh, just think of what you see now. Like I'm not in any way saying you know the Israelis or the Israeli government is perfect, but think of the illogical hate for those people like defending themselves. Like 
They're terrorists. Didn't those dudes just shoot like 3,000 rockets at them? Like, if that had been the United States, we would have annihilated that country, you know? Like, I don't know. I yeah. just see that. And it's like, man, that kind of illogical hatred could be, could and will be turned on Christians, you know? Wouldn't take anything. I, I, yeah, I, I, you know, personally, I, I, years ago, I used to, um, you know, fear the demonic. I used to, you know, all those things. I used to fear ghosts, the whole thing, you know? And I, and I feel like as time has went on, especially as we get closer to this time, I feel like we're coming into, God has really taken that away. And, and he's almost replaced it with a warrior-like mindset. I mean, I, 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 you know, if I feel any type of tension in the room, I mean, I'm casting that thing back to the pit where it came from. So, you know, it's, um, it, it's kind of a cool, cool thing that I've experienced throughout my walk with God of how he's changed my mind and my heart towards those things. And again, as we come into this time, I feel like, you know, as men of God, we're going to be used in a big way to cast out the, you know, demons and the whole thing. You know, what did Jesus say? You're going to do greater things than, than me. Um, and, and I feel like, again, as we get closer to time, it's going to be more and more prevalent. Yeah. Remember Jesus said, greater is he in you than he that is in the world. Right. So God is just revealing to you the power, um, that you have in you and you're just tapping into that, you know, God's for you, who could be against you. And, and part of that tapping too, especially because it's Christ revealing as, as revelations is being read out loud, Christ is revealing even us as Kings and priests. Kings make decrees. They declare biblical truths to the condition around us. We do that in prayer. We do that audibly. We do that with force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And we do that not with this sense of like trying to be altruistic or holier than thou. We're doing it because we have hearts for God. Even Kevin in the comments, Ephesians 2.10, as well as, you know, regarding a warrior lays down his life after God's heart. Absolutely. And if if you look at this, we have to be exercising our faith, our authority in prayer first before all this starts to fold out. We have the honor of doing that. I think a lot of people actually kind of take it like, oh, I, you know, we're, we're just going to prepare. We're just going to have guns. Like a lot of dudes I know are like, I'm just going to pull a trigger. I'm good. I got myself. Really? So as the demons come to torment you, you think you got you? No, they don't. And so they're going to seek deliverance. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Yeah. After God's heart makes a stand. What's cool too about the whole Ephesian armor is that God did it first. Look at Isaiah 58. It's exact, or Isaiah 59. It's exactly what God, all those things that God's telling us to put on, that Paul's telling us to put on, it's exactly what God did. But it, but within that is we have the honor of speaking life and declaring life and life more abundantly and praying future provision, future, future miracles. It's just our unbelief keeps a lot of people at bay from praying above their pay grade. We're not supposed to pray at our pay grade. We're supposed to pray as if Christ is saying these things. We're supposed to be declaring, like making declarations that would make most other people a little pee shy, like, oh, no, oh, I, I can't say that. I, why? Because you have little faith. And so part of this, even making declarations, is to exercise your faith. That's why, you know, even Proverbs and Psalms say, like, don't make a vow to God that you have no intention of honoring. It doesn't say don't make a vow. Just honor it. See it through. It, there's a powerful thing when it comes to this. And so... Yeah, dude, you're absolutely right. Like, this is all, as this goes kinetic, we're going to be performing exploits. That's the way that, that this, the whole book plays out the way. The scenario that's coming up, we don't stand a chance. The church is supposed to respond as an institution to institutional evil. And that there is no church to respond right now, which means our backs can be put against the wall, which is exactly where the enemy doesn't want our faith on display. Because every time our backs are against the wall, our, our faith amplifies and comes forward in ways that the enemy doesn't stand a chance against. Yeah, I, I mean, where, where is the church in, in raising up warriors? It, it's always been my question. Where is the church in, speech, in, in preaching spiritual warfare? Uh, that, that's always been my question, especially the last five, ten years, is you don't, you don't hear of many sermons on, on casting out demons and, um, and recognizing when somebody's demon-possessed. You just you don't hear it anymore. It's, it's, it's non-existent. This, the, the easiest thing for you to understand, the church has been compromised. If you look at it through that lens, the church has to be set free. And what's likely going to kind of jostle the church free from, from its own 
lethargy, apathy, and apostasy is going to be judgment. Judgment comes to the house of God first. And so because of that, praise God, because the church needs to be refined, it needs to be woken up, and ultimately, men of God, like all you guys pressing in on stuff like this, it's a Thursday night. We've already been on for almost two hours. All of you guys pressing in, again, two hours, where people can barely check a box for an hour and a half on a Sunday and say, like, no, God has my time. It's like, ah, we're doing things different. Why? Because it might just be the 1% of people that when things go kinetic actually gets the work done. We already have the biblical precedence. Even then, okay, so look at, look at the, the virgins with the oil. Five virgins with and five without. It's the body of Christ. Like, God has given us math as to what we can expect. It's just the math is uncomfortable. People don't want to believe that half the Christians that they know actually aren't, in fact, Christians. But the Lord sees the heart. The Lord's the only one that judges those things. And even with people that took the, took the, took the jab, listen, Jeremiah 17, curse are those that trust in men, bless those that trust in God. As this unfolds, his church is going to emerge from the ashes of what the church is right now. And ultimately, the cultural church will vilify the spiritual church because the cultural church ushers in the Antichrist. The, with the cultural church will be clamoring and begging for peace as lawlessness abounds. They will usher in the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. And then, you know, the stage is really set. So, man, this, this, your, your sense of what you have, so many other people have it. I think a lot of the patriotic American group has it, and they're looking for the church to emerge without realizing, like, the Holy Spirit needs to bring them forward, and they need to have the balls to, to step foot inside church and start to effectuate change. They need to become change agents. And a, and a lot of men, honestly, that's why we're doing this. That's why I'm recording this, because eventually we're going to be on display that's exactly where God wants us. It's exactly where the enemy doesn't. And remember what Peter tells us, you mentioned it already, Steve, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God, right? So we're to expect that judgment begins within the church itself first. The separating of the wheat from the chaff, the refiner's fire is going to come into God's church first. And but we're being told, well, goodness gracious, it's going to be bad for us. Just imagine what it's going to be like for those out in the world who aren't obeying Christ, right? It's going to be 10 times worse for them. So this division that you see erupting in your churches all over, it's all biblical. I mean, it's all prophetic. It's all been prophesied. We're all, we're all to expect it. And instead of shying away from it or trying to keep it from happening, I say flush it out. Flush everybody out within your church who is on the wrong side. Right. And, and, and the funny part is, and again, you're not doing it to be a dick, but like get to church and the spirit, if, if, the, if the hand of God is on you and the spirit of God's within you, God needs you in that atmosphere. If it's yeah. an ap atmosphere that wants to be watered down and coddled and, and safe and yeah. nice, God doesn't even need you to be nice. God just yeah. needs you to be the fullest version of who you are. Nice is a complete lie. It's a complete fallacy. Yeah. And because of that, right, what's happening? It's because people think like, oh, there aren't guys like me, so I'm not going to go to that stupid church. It's like, no, dude, you're missing the point. That's exactly why you need to go to that church. You and need God, to make you, you need to you out of his mouth, right? When you're lukewarm. And so, at that point, what do men men gravitate towards? Other men that are walking, that are walking the walk, and they're actually on display. If you're not on display and you're not in the atmosphere, I hate to say it, you're like a parked car. God can't move a parked car. He can't stir a parked car. Like He's hoping that you're actually going to engage and. And, and you're going to be of use even when you're uncomfortable around people that you deem are not actually operating with spiritual gifts. Kevin just posted a note. Kevin, can you talk? Look at me trying to read on like this tiny screen. Let's get back to the comment. Um, you know, Andrew, does that make sense? We lost him. Well, that sucks. All right. Let me digress. Okay. Oh, you're all good, man. All good, Kevin. Um, oh, we're going to keep diving in. Um, okay, so what's Sambalot doing? He's talking trash, but look at what he's asking. And, and this is something that, that like hit me. So he's he spoke before his brethren and the army and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Well, they offer sacrifices. The enemy doesn't want us offering sacrifices. Where do we offer? What's the new altar that we have? It's within us. It's our heart, right? The altar within 
altar of faith, what are we sacrificing to God that we know as we you know dive forward in obedience and in sacrifice, the devil does not want us sacrificing things that he wants to keep. If it's a vice, the devil wants us operating and dancing with our vice. He wants us dancing with the devils that we're trying to destroy. And if you can do that, right, that's why the enemy wants to know what are they, what are they sacrificing? And then the enemy wants to somehow, you know, strengthen his attack on you in that regard. They will, will they complete it in a day? Like how fast? The enemy's asking how fast is, are they going to operate? Will they receive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? So, so basically. Uh, Sorry, guys, I lost you. All good, man. Welcome back. Um, does that make sense, though? We cover the bases? Absolutely does. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, we, we kept diving through and just basically like the enemy's asking, right? What is what what are we gonna do? What are we gonna use? What are we gonna sacrifice? What do we have to build with? So if if you look at that like a spiritual response where the enemy's looking at like how capable are these people of God, that's absolutely something that we need to with joy operate to the fullest measure, spiritual giftings, everything, and just basically give the enemy a reason to be afraid and again it's not about our trying the devil laughs at us and mocks us because good men try every single day to be better men it's when we actually get our shit together and actually champion these things and actually really do succeed at our faith and our endeavors and our walk in, with god it says now to buy the ammonite was beside him and he said whatever they build if even a fox goes up on it he will break down their stone wall right so the enemy's arrogant and prideful Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So Nina's my saying, so we built the wall. So think about what, what that prayer says. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. He's not basically withholding back. He's, he's throwing everything at him. So Nehemiah is saying, we build the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had in mind to work. Now it happened when Sambalot, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored, and the gaps were beginning to be closed. Think about like a phalanx wall. Think about that shield wall that you would see in, in old you know, military times. They want to see gaps. They want to see gaps. They want to see people disconnected in their faith and their walk, you know, kind of isolated and alone. We have to close ranks and close those gaps as best we can. That they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, think about that. They all conspired to create confusion. What's the enemy trying to capitalize on today and create confusion? Like we see the enemy's institutional evil ushering in complete confusion on every level where they call a lie truth and the truth a lie. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. And sometimes a watchman's position isn't just warning, sometimes even taking your place on the wall in prayer, right? Sometimes the enemy doesn't attack because you're on that wall. And if that's the case, that's, you know, God's got you where he, he you know, he can use you. Then Judas said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything, right? They're making a verbal declaration, right? The power of life and death are in the tongue. So they're speaking out loud. They will neither know or see anything. Spiritual blindness. What's affecting this country at scale? Spiritual blindness. And there is... Uh, nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So the enemy is hoping that in their plans, in their spoken, you know, utterances, their prayers, their praise, everything, that they will confuse us, confound us, that we will be blind until they're already amongst us and destroy us. Kind of like UN troops getting smuggled in through the southern border. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. So again, people within our own community are coming in with this fearful, bad report. Therefore, and you am I saying this, therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, 
Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. What do you think about urban warfare? What is that going to look like? As commu- again, this is the call to get to community at your local church and operate from that spiritual footing. Uh, Kevin, it's New King James. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. This is language that we use in prayer. God bring their plans to nothing. That all of us return to the wall, everyone to his work. So again, the enemy's attack of confusion was actually disrupting what God was trying to accomplish. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other hand held a weapon. For every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Think about that. So Nehemiah is the actual like practical leader while Ezra was the spiritual leader. Nehemiah is saying, when I sound the alarm, when there's a reason to give you and tell you to be worried, your leadership is the one that's supposed to you know, sound that alarm. The leader in this case for us is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to sound that alarm. Uh, oh, Nate, not sure what verse that was in reference to. I was just responding to Kevin. Oh, cool. Which verse was that? I think you said it was the New King James. <laughs> oh, what verse? Oh, sorry, man. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm jumping on. That one part about community um, is actually verse 14. Yeah, it's not very afraid. You're at verse 19 now. Yep. Um, to the best part. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there our expectation is that the holy spirit will absolutely rally his people you're going to have a just a desire like just a word like i need to be here i need to leave i need to go i need to do this we have to trust that little voice is going to orchestrate those people that are pressing in and listening to him our god will fight for us so as he says wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there our god will fight for us Nehemiah is saying, we're going to rally because we're all carrying weapons and you're going to listen for the sound, but our God will fight for us. As we go back to numbers, and I think it was last week, the week before, we're talking about how God takes credit for our battles that he's calling us to. And because of that, what? why would we even be bold enough to say that? Because we're making a declaration. God is going to fight. We're going to show up with the weapons. We're going to show up and answer the call, and God is going to fight for us. We're declaring it first before it even happens. Nehemiah is showing us that this is this is the average daily walk of a God-fearing believer. So we labored in the work, which for us is it's evangelism, it's delivering, casting you know demons out, it's it's whatever the Holy Spirit's calling us to do. So we labored in the work, and half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the time, at the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the God who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Praise God. Nehemiah 4 is freaking packed. Yeah, that's a cool, cool chapter. It's, and everyone understands that the whole balance between like Nehemiah and Ezra. So Ezra was focused as the priest that Xerxes gave this whole letter. He gave this whole, like, you'll do four things. You will either teach people your law. You will have them serve you as slaves. Um, you will kick them out of the city, or you will kill them if they refuse to f- if follow your law and still desire to be among you. So Xerxes said, you can rule with a freaking iron fist within Jerusalem as you're rebuilding the city. And Ezra's response to that letter and that declaration of the king was, praise God, the king gave us money to rebuild the temple. So pastors and money, it's not really a new thing. So just pop that bubble. You're welcome. All right. And so as we kind of got that part, right, it's verse 14 that, that enumerated what we do for the community. Deuteronomy 20 is pretty cool. And it's, it's relevant for, for different ways, right? As we're supposed to look at men of God within the body of Christ, those of fighting age. 
And this is the principles governing warfare. And I'm going to get, get through this quick and we can talk after, but Psalm 89 is actually the, the fruit of this. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart be faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God, he will, who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. Think about that, right? The pastor is giving the people a pep talk to warfare. That's a little contrarian to how most pastors would be today. Most. Then the officers shall speak to the people saying, and this is like, imagine an officer, right? You're a spiritual leader within the faith, within the group. What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle of another man uh, and another man eat it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man marry her. What does that all speak to? God has a plan for your life and you've applied yourself with work. See the work through. As God calls you forward, God's, you know, God's going to make all these, you know, bring them into pass. But you need to kind of like get through your, you want to have a reason to fight. I look at those things as they are all reasons to fight. You've got something to fight for. You've got a home that you built, a vineyard that you you know planted, and a wife that you want to get home to, right? What's your why? What's everyone's why for their spiritual position? The officers shall speak. So again, the first the priest spoke. Now the officers who spoke to the other people who were still young and didn't accomplish things. Now the officers are speaking again further to the people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted, right? Cowards will enter heaven. Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. Atmosphere, spiritual atmosphere. So if someone is afraid within your group, you need to keep refining that group until you're left with people who are unafraid. Again, you're trying to bring people up, but if they're still of a maturity that isn't there, you need to be mindful of that. Be aware of it. When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but make war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil you shall plunder for yourself. And you shall eat the enemies plunder which the lord your god gives you thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you which are not of the cities of these nations which are the the 31 empires that were around israel when they were in the wilderness but of the cities of these people which lord your god gives you as an inheritance you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive it's a scorched earth policy so as it relates to even like the, the spiritual condition around us, right? When we pray, right? You're praying against everything. You're declaring destruction to every spiritual, you know, host of wickedness that's operating around you. You shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, says the Lord your God, has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. It's exactly what Solomon did. Solomon hoard his way and slept his way through a bunch of different wives that were all foreign wives. That's how he attained so much peace. And what happened? He slept his way out of faith and relationship with God. When you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege. For the tree of the field is man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. I just didn't know if any of you guys have ever read that. I love that chapter. I think we talked about this last week, the differences of when God 
told the Israelites to go in and lay siege to a city and kill every man, but then just capture the women and the children and the flock and plunder that versus the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittite, Hivites, Jebusites. These cultures were so corrupted, so, so sold out of their sin. There was nothing redeeming, not even the animals, that everything that breathed had to die. And then many a time God would instruct not only to kill every man, woman, child, and beast, but then to burn the entire city to the ground. So these people could go so far down a road of being corrupted, there is no redeeming them at all. And all they're going to be is a cancer within Israel if they save anything. And, and you got to so, wonder... So would you... So would you say that, you know, kind of what you're just saying, would you say that's similar to what's happening today? We have people that are just so far gone that uh, I, I don't know that I would use there's no hope, but but it's it's very unlikely they're coming back. Uh, you can say the word there's no hope because the uh, Bible clearly teaches that there are people that the Lord gives over to their own depravity. And once you're given over to your own depravity, you have no chance of reconnecting with God because it is God that draws you into a relationship. And if God no longer is drawing you, you have no ability on your own. You're dead in your sins. And at that point, you are basically cut off from the kingdom of God. So like Steve said, there in those moments, the Holy Spirit himself will declare to you who that person is that you're confronting, whether they are cut off or not. When's the last time you've been to San Francisco? Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. It's okay. just an incredible thought. It, it's just an absolutely incredible thought to think that, you know, people can get to that point where God says, you know, <laughs> you're, there, there's no hope here. You, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're dead to me, basically. You, you know, you're, I'm going to leave you to your sin and, and have at it. it. It's just an incredible thought. Well, go to Isaiah 59. God says, hey, my arms are not so short that I can't reach you, nor my ears, you know, death that I can't hear you, but your sin has put separation between you and I, where now I don't even hear your prayers. I cover my ears because when you're praying, it's like noise to me, right? Well, it, Jeremiah 14 actually says, do not pray for their good. Yeah. Like those, those people that don't want anything to do with me, that have turned their back on me, don't pray for their good. Which I mean, if, if you do, I won't hear them. Yeah. Like the, the Bible's filled with moments where even in your conversations with God, there's a certain point where if you cross the line, you start praying for people that he has already written off. Again, the Lord knows those that are his. He as, as we abide in him, he abides in us. If we do not abide in him, he does not abide in us. And thankfully for grace and the Holy Spirit, right, the indwelling, right? So when we leave the ranch and mess up, we have, we have a chance to reconcile. But there are people who absolutely understand the nature of God and do not love him or fear him. Think about biblical scholars. They think 60%, if not more, of biblical scholars that go to school and know the Bible better than most Christians do. They don't have faith. They just study it as a historical document. And, and what about what about what Paul says in Romans? That you know he ponders what if God created these vessels for his wrath so he could show us great mercy. So if God's created vessels for wrath. You know, there's no kumbaya moment you're going to have with that person to drag them into the kingdom of God, right? Look, <laughs> Isaiah, it's, 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 that's, always par, that's always just rattled my mind or just, I don't know, but, you know, because, it, you know, it says God, before the earth was created, God chose you, right? So, you know, what about all these people? Are, are they just like you're saying, like just vessels for God's wrath that he's just going to take his vengeance out like these people weren't chosen? Like that, that's always kind of made no, me no, think no, no. like... Paul puts that out as a possibility. He says, what if, right? What if God did create some of these people like, like Ramses, right? Uh, the whole story of freeing the, uh, them from Egypt, right? The children of Israel from Egypt. Very much so, Ramses was not really functioning on his own accord. God hardened his heart. I mean, he really, how does he stand up against that, right? At that moment, his free will was not really in a mix. And now a lot of people will argue that, oh, no, no, no. Well, God's sovereignty is such that God can step outside of the box from time to time and do things that are required to be done in order for his plan to see itself through as defined, right? And so those are the one-offs. So we don't want to define God by the one-offs, but God can do the one-offs. And so we, we just have to kind of like take a few steps back 
from time to time. Yeah, and I wouldn't look at people and say, oh, they're for God's wrath. But clearly, if they've been given over to their own depravity, the Holy Spirit will tell you that. And at that point, you need to back away because there's really, there's no saving them at that point. They, they've literally been cut off from God. Kevin, what do you got? You got something chambered? Yeah, no, it's, it just boils down to, you know, the freedom of will. You know, you have all the choices in the world. I mean, you can see the examples. You reject it on face value, and then you turn your back on it. That's your own choice. You know, I mean, you have people like us here speaking this day in, day out, all the time. And it's like, you know, what's the difference between them and us? You know, it's like, hey, we accept it as truth. They just see it as, oh, this is all made up fairy tale stuff. It's like, you're creating your own path, my man. Like, I can only lead you so far, but you should yeah. just completely turn your back on it. And it's like, it's the freedom of choice, you know? It, yeah. It's free will. It's, and it's, it's, it's day one stuff. It's day so, one so, stuff. So you, think, so you think everybody at some point in time will have a turning point to where they can choose which path to walk? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, it's death by yes. a thousand cuts. I mean, you don't die on the thousandth, thousandth cut. You died on cut 687 because by that time, you're bleeding out all over the place. There's no chance of you surviving it, right? So this constant right. denying God and constantly rejecting God's reach in your life, constantly re rejecting the gospel message, at some point that becomes your fate. You've chosen to be separated from God. And in that moment when God gives you over, to your own depravity, you're done. That's it. And then, yeah, the yeah, it's, it's just, their own it death. just rattles my mind that somebody would get to a point where, you know, I, I just they wouldn't choose God. I, I just for the life of me, I, you know, obviously we've all been down times in our lives. I'm sure yeah. everybody here that that we maybe we weren't as close to God as what we should be. But but you know speaking you know I'm I'm not you know I'm not perfect by any means. But I I, I don't know that I'd ever would have got that far to where i would, wouldn't choose god or wouldn't turn back i just that just rattles my mind but, i just don't jesus jesus gave us the answer did he not he said light has come into the world but men chose the darkness because right. they love their sin right and so exactly you know basically he says we're, we're already all judged and lights come into the world but we've rejected it and so we've rejected it because we're in love with our sin so it's not baffling why we reject it jesus told us why right but I hear you. I hear what you're saying because I, I, I wrestle with that myself. How can a thinking, reasoning person not ultimately see the truth of Christ and know that's where you need to go? So, you know, I don't get that um, veil that seems to be over certain people where they just continue to reject what seems to be entirely obvious to me. And they continue and, to reject it because they're in love with their sin. I, I don't get that, but and, they're out so or, or it's it's like self-deception, right? They've deceived themselves to believe like they, they've got it. They're their own God, self-God. Yeah. But we have to remember the Bible was written to believers. Yeah. The Bible wasn't written to non-believers. And so when it makes statements like, I knew you, you know, in the womb, right? God God has formed everything and, until we cross the line of the whole human hybrids, which is already here. But here's here's the other part. You can't force someone to have a root canal. Right. If they don't feel pain... If they don't know that there's a cat, that there's something growing that's destroying them inside, if they refuse to acknowledge what that the source of that pain is, they will not have an elective root canal. They'll think it's a functioning tooth, it's a functioning life. God doesn't force anyone to have a root canal. God doesn't force anyone into that chair. You have to want to be in that chair. And usually, what happens is people's lives start falling apart, and they they can't manage, they can't do the pain, and we have to be aware that God is operating all these things for, for the betterment of those that love him. And when Isaiah 10 says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, who had no heart for war, no mind for murder, yet I gave him one to punish the Israelites. And then what, what did God do to, the, um, to Assyria? When Assyria became proudful for what they did to the Israelites, God destroyed the Assyrians. Right. Like they, they were just, they, they, they were cattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they could have actually probably gotten by without being destroyed if it wasn't for the fact that they became prideful of what God stirred their heart to do. And so when you look at this stuff, like that's why it's the weight of glory. You step back and you're like, oh my gosh, praise God that we've been chosen and grafted in. And because we are actually watching on broad 
you know, in broad daylight on TV everywhere, there are those that are not his. And for whatever reason, we're in. Praise God. Well, I mean, you, you could use the example of the Magog War, right? You know, it talks about the God putting a fish hook, you know, in, in his mouth and dragging him, you know, to, to attack uh, Israel. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand almost, you know. Right. Totally. But, but we, we can praise God because his judgment is just. Scripture tells us that, right? We, we are God's most prized creation. And the greatest gift that he's given us is the gift of free will. We can choose God or choose otherwise, right? And he's not going to force himself upon us. So if we end up going to hell, it's by our own choice, right? It's not it's not that God is, you know, slaying us because we, we've gone because we've chosen to go. So his judgment is ultimately just. We've just gotten what we've wanted. And that's why when we're in heaven, we're not going to grieve about those that we love who aren't in heaven that ended up going to hell because we're all going to see that God's judgment was just. And when they're dragged up out of Gehenna a thousand years later after the millennial reign and they're brought up to the great white throne judgment, they're going to get a, this was your life. And every time you guys evangelized them or gave them the truth of Christ and they rejected it, they're going to see that on a screen and be reminded of every opportunity they had to find Christ and they denied every single time. So when they are cast into the eternal lake of fire, it will be a just <laughs> judgment. Amen. Maybe. Yeah, uh, can I add something really quick? Yeah, sure. Of course, dude. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just I've noted this on on my own accord, and um, all the people that I come in contact with in my line of work and, and in the past. But you know, it, it seems to what we're talking about, it, it is simply a rebellion against authority, right? And we know that God is the ultimate authority and the governing yeah. figure in the entire universe. And so, the same way that there are laws here on the streets that we have a, a penal code that says, hey, if you do this, these are the repercussions, but yet you still have people do it. You still have people do it. They're like, hey, you know what? Uh, it's just my selfish whatever intentions fill in the blank override everything that is said that I shouldn't be doing, yet they still do it. It's the exact same principles as the same deal what we're just talking about right now. You can preach this down someone's throat and say, this is going to lead to death, man. It's just not it. Yet, they yeah. still choose it. And it's like, man, I can always say, you want to go to prison for 20 years? You want to have eternal damnation? Man, I mean, that's entirely up to you. It's like, how much clearer do you have to be? These people make their own choices. They, See that, it's right, a, it's a, right there, brother. It's, you have the heart of a pastor right there. You have the it, it, love it's for, exactly it. for eternal salvation, right? That's it. I mean, yeah. it's, it, there's so many parallels to what's going on. You talk, I mean, I could go off on this forever, but you talk about the fatherless homes. There's a reason why these po politicians love fatherless homes and that they're preaching feminism up the wazoo. I mean, this is, again, it's a rebellion against God. Everything yep. boils down to rebellion against authority, yep. which is a rebellion against God. Why do we have these uh, BLM protests? Why do we have all this? Why are cops the bad guys? It's authority. It's a rebellion against authority, which yeah. all points back to the scriptures. It's a rebellion against God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, kind of, again, you know, the Bible tells us we're, we're not fighting flesh and blood. You know, we're, we're fighting things of, of uh, you know, so, dark, we're fighting darkness. You know, so, yeah. And so it comes back okay. to the thought of, of spiritual warfare of, yeah. You know, and, and man tries to do things a lot on his own. You know, that's human nature. Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to make it happen. But, but but we're powerless without the Holy Spirit. So it comes back Amen. to, you know, taking these things up in prayer, preparing this, per, you know, hey, prepare these people's hearts and minds to accept what I'm going to tell them uh, before we even step foot on a street to preach. And I, and I think, you know, again, it's, it comes back to the Holy Spirit power and in, 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 in praying and in, in letting God do the things that we can't, right? Because if we just go out there and, and we preach without the power of the Holy Spirit behind it, it's just words. And, it, and people aren't going to accept it. Amen. 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 I mean, you have to fall flat on your face until you realize something, right? And that's usually the, the turning point for most people. We're stubborn as hell. And we, especially men, we love to learn the most difficult possible painful way and usually that'll be the turning point but if that doesn't do it nothing will right so i wow i, I, we, I we would hope so but typically that's it 
I, I say this pretty often, especially when um, this question comes up, right? Most people have to get to the end of themselves to get to the beginning of God. Amen. If wow, you, that's, that's, a, that's an incredible saying. I've never heard that before. That's good. That's really if, good. If you can't get to the end of yourself, it means that you still think that you have runway. You still think that you have a little more vice to take, another pill to take, another drink to take, uh, more porn, another girl to sleep with. You're, you're one thing away from that next feeling of like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, not Amen. fine. And right. so, and so, what we're really trying to help people do is meet them, and we we trust and we pray the Holy Spirit is causing us to meet people where they have reached the end of themselves, and then then what do we know? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, which means you can't even hand someone a Bible and think that they're going to read it and understand it. They have to be taught, they have to hear it, they have to have a desire, and then once they start brushing up, it's that heart posture where they no longer have a hardened heart, where God's like, "Cool, I can do something with this." And, yes. and until that happens, but here's what's cool. The Bible gives us examples of even like men of God hashing these thoughts out. And then what are they, what's their response? How do they pray? What do they declare? What's their warning? And then what's their plea to God as well as their plea to the people around us? And that's, I mean, to dive it back in, like Psalm 89 is cool, right? Psalm 119 is like the schizophrenic prayer where you're all over the place. You're, you're on this end, on that end, right? If you, I, I, I try and tell men all the time, if you want to have a, a like a move of God and re, like almost like take the paddles back and, reju- and like restore your heart, rejuvenate your heart, resuscitate it, go outside to an open field and yell Psalm 119 at the top of your lungs and tell me that God doesn't show up. Like with every fiber of your being, you can't, you can't recite that Psalm and not have something like move within you because of it. But I'm even looking at Psalm 89, and when I came across this, I, it, it's been a minute. Like, I probably haven't read this in at least, like, I don't know, four or five years. I know everyone's like, read a psalm a day. It's going to work. I'm like, yeah, sometimes. Just sometimes they slip through the cracks. I'm going to read it, and then you guys, you know, chime in. This is a uh, contemplation of Ethan, the Ezrahite. Ezrahite? I think. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness, you shall establish the very heavens. So that's his praise, right? And then his why. I have made a covenant with my chosen. This is God's. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And now this is a declaration. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. Like, imagine you're saying these things. If you're in a moment where you're almost like forgetting the condition around you, like you, this is something to fall back on and recite. When the waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you've created them. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are your foundation and your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our King to the Holy One of Israel. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One. And this is God's promise to us. And said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. Think about God even referring to you in this case. With my holy oil, I've anointed him with whom my hands shall be established. Also, my arm shall shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. 
but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I shall keep for him forever. My covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. But then then the warning comes, right? So all these things, within one psalm, he's given us these conditions. He's making its praise, its declarations, God's promise to us. But then what's the condition, right? And so, so many modern Christians think that there is no condition. I yeah. think this is unconditional. But it's, again, like so many of these Psalms were prophetic and there were warnings. And it, when you read this. So let me throw in there too, Steve. Do a, do a search for the word but, right? B-U-T. And just take note of how many conditional things are in the New Testament. If you do this, you know, you get all this great stuff. But. And then there's a, a pretty heavy hammer that comes after the butt. I don't know why Christians seem to dismiss the butt, but many things are conditional. So obedience is important. And, and and the best part is he tells us the promise that's related to the condition. If you and as as for me, I want those promises. I want every single last one of them. But so the warning, if the sons forsake if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments. If they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod, which is correction, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. Remember, this is a book written to believers. Not allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn... By my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. And then here's the reality, the assessment. But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is reproached to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease. I'm going to read that part one more time. I'm going to read it as if we have dismissed, discounted, and let down God. And when you hear it, you tell me, you know, you tell me how this thing's in. You have cast off and abhorred him. You've been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. Think about all the people around us who have no heart for Christ. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is approached to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. Right, we, You've elevated demonic and you know demonized people. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame. And then the plea and the prayer. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will you will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created all the children of men? What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. It's, it's like the, the plea and the prayer of a man of God who sees society falling down all around him. And is doing his best to warn, and evangelize, and speak the truth. And how does he end it? Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. I like guess it's, it's basically it's praying your heart out. It's it's having eyes wide open to the situation and the assessment of what the current reality is. And it's like basically ending and saying like, 
Father, your will be done. Like I'm doing everything we can. Remember, you know, we want to bring back your old loving kindnesses. That's what we're asking for. And we're just asking that if God is going to send people, if God is going to use people, that God send us and use us. And we know as the compression continues, the recompense of the wicked will be poured out, but so will the reward of God's righteous. And so this is, this whole thing about going from Nehemiah back to Deuteronomy and then here, it's just, we know what God wants to do with us, for us, through us. We know the promises. We know the instruction, right? Hebrews 15, right? What was written of old is useful for instruction, but we still have to be aware of the reality that sets around us, not afraid of it, not to dismiss it because we still are trying to stir God's heart for the conditions that we're in. This all gets back to prayer, all of it. I, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, we'll segue and go sideways on preparing on guns on, you know, all the things that we can do within our own fleshly hands. But all this gets back to just acknowledging God is who he is. God's allowing these things to happen. And we need to be in a posture of continual prayer in order to make sure that we're on the right path and the right page. So, so would you say we have it easier with the new covenant? I mean, it, we're talking Old Testament, Old Covenant. Would you say now being warriors of God in the new covenant that we have an advantage to where they didn't before because we now have Holy Spirit power? Absolutely. When you say easy, easy in what regard? Because there's easy well, on... Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe easy is not the right word, but uh, you know, just an advantage, maybe just just yeah. you know, new covenant all day. All yeah. day. All day. Yeah. yeah, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit versus the resting upon of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is superior. You know, God is in us now. That's what you know. Yeah, we are the temple. We are yeah, the temple. We are the temple. The the, the the law is written on our hearts. God, God in us. You know, we are now called His friend. Uh, we are serving, you know, in his kingdom alongside of him when we go to eternity. We're connected with him right now. So, yeah, we have God's guidance and we have his ministry. We have his assurance. We have his counsel. We have all those things now. And so in that sense, if we tap into it and pay attention to it and and just exercise that muscle that has to do with hearing in the spirit realm instead of exercising the muscle of the world and the flesh and we just start tuning into that frequency of the spirit realm and hearing from god in that quiet still voice that he speaks in from time to time to us then we draw to him instead of drawing to the world so it's it is an advantage that we have that they didn't i'll put it this way it's an advantage if we're operating with the holy spirit yeah it is of no advantage if all we do is exist with a philosophical faith, it's actually a detriment because I mean, what happens, right? We, we know of all these things. We know of these promises. We call them what they are, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're stunted in our ability to actually operate within the spiritual realm. Well, I, I think we lack an understanding, right? Because all truth and knowledge is, is really from Christ. And, so if we're not operating through the spirit, we're not we're not getting the full full measure of what scripture means, I think, in some ways. I, I think it's that, but I think it's also unbelief. If you don't take the word of God at at full face value and you've got strong like complex systems of unbelief, which is a, a mental stronghold, you're inviting spiritual strongholds of unbelief. You're actually inviting like the enemy to like come in and even further blind you and keep you at arm's length. And so, yes, the, the knowledge is one thing, but again, people know this book very well and don't have faith. They, they do not operate and exercise their faith, which means God's like, uh, if only you did, this would be a lot cooler if you did. It almost feels like, you know, that Matthew McConaughey, what's that freaking dazed and confused? Be a, be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> and, and, and here's just another thing that'll completely cook your noodle. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 14, the very, very last verse, the last half, the last verse, he says, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So I want you to think about that, because that, that has to cook your brain a little bit. If it's not of faith, it's sin, meaning God's will for your life is perfect. 
And if you stay in the shadow of the Holy Spirit, following the Holy Spirit, you're all good. The minute you step outside of the shadow of the Holy Spirit and following the Holy Spirit and you start doing your own thing, you're now in sin. Because why? Because God's will for your life is, is perfect. And now you've decided you know better, what we call moral relativity in the world of eggheads, right? You've decided you know better than God and now you're going to do it your way. Well, Paul tells us the minute you do that, you're in sin now. You've just stepped, stepped out of sight of God's perfect will. So yeah, we, we do have an advantage over those who had only the resting upon from time to time in the spirit. We have the indwelling now and it's the power of God in us. And like I said, it's going to be an amazing thing for the unbelieving world to watch unfold as we get into these last days. And, and this is why there's a big distinction. You've got a lot of Christians who are consuming Christ, and they're, they're praying to a version of Christ that doesn't exist. They've made an idol yeah. of, a, of a very tolerant Christ that yeah. never, never existed. Yeah. And they, they, do, they, don't, they don't desire correction. They don't desire any sort of reproach. They just have have cultivated apostasy on the verge of heresy. But what what they're really doing is they've they've created self god. They've they've confined God to a box of their own understanding. Yeah. And we we look upon them, and we're not even supposed to spend time with them. Like you know, Apostle Paul tells us like, uh, yeah, of these people, of these believers. They're not even worth your time. Um, I don't worship first. And it, it just here's here's the whole situation. Culturally, as as modern day cultural Christians, we do not call sin out. We do not call out apostasy. We don't call out lethargy. We don't call out people because we think, oh, at least we're on this. We have nice friends. We have nice Christian friends. God doesn't need you to be freaking nice. And, and but because of that, again, like we've allowed ourselves to exist corporately and too much comfort and comfort will kill you was like you look at christ what comfort did christ have especially leading up to the cross right dying dying in comfort will actually cause us to die twice not just once dying in christ causes us to die once i mean it it makes sense you know i mean it really does make sense i mean you look back through the bible you know who in the bible was rich and had a close relationship with god you know or, or jesus i mean everybody walked by faith you know and counted on god for for everything and and you look at this world this world is now a world of comfort everybody's looking for comfort through money through you name it relationships you know human relate whatever and uh, in, in, in like you were saying, it, it's not it doesn't align with what God intended. We're supposed to live and breathe, uh, you know, our relationship with Christ before everything. And it's just we're, we're operating in a world that's anything but that. It's just incredible. Yeah. Praise God, though. Right. Because yeah. as of this moment, we're on this side of the fence. And this is just why I encourage all you guys. Never stop striving. Never stop contending. Never slip the gears into neutral and don't step your foot off the gas because there's only one of two things. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. And the more that you drive at this, what's the Holy Spirit saying? Oh, look, there's my man. He's in it. Hmm. Like this. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's see what he wants to do. Let's see where else we can take this. Let's see how much more I can give him. Let's see how much more he can trust me if I refine him. And so that refiner's fire is something that we should all be dealing with because basically there's, there's two fires, right? It's God's refining fire or there's fiery judgment. What do you want? You want to be refined. Yeah. Remember, you men are priests of the most high God. So just hold that close to the vest. Know that, right? You represent the most yeah. high God. Go out there and slay the world with the truth of Christ. Amen. It's a big order. Yep. I like it. No fear. <laughs> no fear. Nate, you want to pray us out? Yeah. Dear God, I, uh, I thank you for the gathering of these men. I, uh, I thank you for the refinement I get and all of us get from this group. I just pray that you would drive us forward and just bring down angels over the top of us to just give us guidance and to keep these demons off our backs as we go forward, God. Pray these things in uh, in Jesus' name. And I just ask that, you know, as Steve keeps leading this group, you, uh, you keep your hand on him as well. Keep your hand on uh, on his message and 
have your words be his words. And uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. That's a good old day. Thanks, day. guys. Incredible, inc- incredible time. Um, I feel like the Holy Spirit was in it. Absolutely. So Great thank time. you. Appreciate you, bro. All right. Get at it. See you, boys. Yeah. Uh, have a good one, guys. You too. See you next week. Next week. Bye.